Hi, in this video we're going to create a visualization using leaflet.js and we're going to add some controls and interactivity to help us filter through the visualization and hone in on the parts that we're most interested in. So this is what we're going to end up with. This visualization shows the, the GP practices around Scotland, so where they're located. Um, the size of the bubbles in this visualization um, is sort of relative to the um, uh, the doses of prescriptions that the uh, GP practice have, have, has prescribed. The um, the colors that you see here are related to the area and the area's uh, SIMD index. So SIMD is the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. So it tells you how kind of deprived or well-off an area is. So in, um, in this case, the kind of more blue colors are showing well-off areas and the, the, the red ones are more in the red spectrum are um, the more deprived areas. Um, so this is what we're going to start off, um, what, sorry, this is what we're going to end up with. Um, but I'm going to start coding from um, from a, uh, a template, a base template, that looks like this. So um, in, I'm using Glitch to code here. Um, and this, if you follow, essentially if you follow the tutorial on the Leaflet website, you will be um, introduced into just adding a map to um, a development um, on the page, and then it will um, guide you through like adding some basic uh, shapes. So if you go to leaflet tutorials, um, there's a message here about the creator of leaflet who um, is from Ukraine. Um, anyway, so if you go to the leaflet quick start guide, and you can follow this, it shows you the sort of uh, basics of creating a map. Um, so you include the CSS, the JavaScript file, you add a development with an ID of map, set up the map um, with a, the height and width that you wish the map to be. Um, following from that, um, you tell the map where to center it on. And um, we add the map tiles. We have to add the tiles, uh, we have to choose the kind of layer, um, the tile link layers that we want to use. So I'm I'm following the same thing that they do on the tutorial, importing tiles from OpenStreetMap. Um, it then shows you how to add a marker and uh, and circle. So I'm going to skip past um, and assume we've kind of done this. So in my, um, I'll just walk through what the the starting point where we have here. So um, I have got an HTML page. Um, We've added the style sheet for leaflet. We have the script for the leaflet map. Um, and then in here, um, we've got the body. I might just zoom in a little bit so that we can see the code. Um, I've got a main wrapper, I've got my heading. And then I have a div element here with the ID of map, just like in the example, and height and width of 350. So I could actually go ahead and make these a little bit bigger just so we can see our visualization. Um, there we go. And then into the script. So um, essentially we're defining a map object um, using leaflet. So l.map, it's gonna give us a new, a new map object. We pass in the ID and we set the view, which is the coordinates of where we want to center and the zoom level. So zoom level being low is um, zoomed out and about 20, I think is the max of um, zooming in. So let's leave it at 12. Um, we add our tiles and now we have a circle. So um, we're, the first thing we're gonna do is kind of just check in on the reference that tells us what we can do and how we can style the circle and any other elements that we have. So if I go back to the docs, and I go down to vector layers. So we have circle as a vector layer. And in here we can, um, if you see how you've got a usage example, this is pretty much what we are using. And the point, um, a radi we define a radius, we can define a color. Um, there are the options. So circle is a kind of class that inherits from path. So Anything that we can do to a path, we can do to a circle. So we can set the stroke color, um, the kind of width of, of the of the line 
uh, of the boundary circle line. Um, and I can change this to, let's say, purple, right? Or I can use, um, so color is the, the stroke color, um, or I can use the hex, EF, EF, EF. Um, so that's a kind of silver one. And then there's a, an opacity, a radius. So later on, the radius, we're going to use that to um, kind of visualize the kind of pr the prescriptions. So um, the first thing I want to do is to kind of start, let's um, start by adding some, uh, dynamically adding some circles to the page. So the main thing that circles, um, I'm just going to come up with an example data set here, a fake, some fake data. The main thing that circles are based on are coordinates, right? So we've got, if you imagine like this, um, chords, and I'm going to add another object to the data set. Um, change the coordinates a little bit. And voila, we've got a data set, right? We've got a very small data set. Um, so to add So to add circles from an array, we're going to look through the array and based on the data that's in the array, we're going to add circles. Um, so each and every, um, so this con, uh, so this syntax here, the for loop. So um, D of data set. So D is, um, it, it iterates through and we have an element for each one of the the data sets. So D is not an index; it's the actual value. So I can do D dot chords. So this um, using this key there, and then I don't need to do anything else. That should now work. So we should have two circles added to the map. And I only see one. So let me just check. I've got something right here. Maybe they're just sitting on top of each other. Uh, what have we got here? Uh, you know, let's see. Are they far apart? Uh, let's have a look. Um, color. Let's make this red again. I just see one circle. Or D, or data set. Uh, one thing we can do if something's going wrong is maybe we can log to the uh, console. I see object and another object, two objects being logged out. That seems fair enough. And what could I do here? So we have a data set. We have coordinate array and we don't actually need this far at the moment. Um, that looks okay to me. Okay, maybe it was just off the screen somewhere. Um, anyway. So we're looping through and for each entry in the data set, we get a circle. And if we look at the docs, there are um, some methods. Uh, so we can set radius to get radius for the circle object. Um, we can add a tooltip. So we've got a method that inherits from layers. So the idea that we've got this kind of layer class that is uh, that that allows us to share methods and properties across different shapes. So you could add, um, I think, you know, a polygon or a rectangle or something. You want to be able to reuse the code. So in um, in object oriented programming, you'll see this um, in, uh, concept of inheritance that gives you um, the ability to reuse those functions across multiple 
or uh, classes. So um, bind tooltip. This looks useful. Bind a tooltip to the layer with the past in content. Um, and here, there's. Uh, I, I think what this is telling us here is, is we can just run bind tooltip, um, give it a string or an HTML element or a function. Um, I'm going to try binding tooltip and just giving it a string. Oh, I deleted that bar circle. Let's put that back in so that we can refer to the circle. I'm going to bind a tooltip. Um, and for now, I'm just going to say hello. 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 Very good. All right. Um, so we've made a start. We've got um, an array and we look through the array and add some circles. Very good. Um, the next thing we probably want to do is to actually start using our data set. So this is where I'm going to import a library from um, that will just help us out a little bit because uh, our data sets in the CSV format and there are very handy libraries out there that will help us, um, first of all, go and fetch the data set remotely, parse the, what will come back, um, the request will just come back and it will just appear to the JavaScript, it'll just appear as text. So we actually need to turn that into um, an array of objects. And thankfully, um, D3 fetch is kind of part of the, D, you know, the whole package of D3 um, functions and libraries. We can um, use some of the convenience methods there to, um, to, to grab our CSV file and um, turn it into an array of objects. So this here, I'm on the, I am on the readme here. Um, if I go to this line here, I'm going to grab this example, switch over to here, and oh, that's not going to work. I don't need to write script. Um, I do notice though. It has this module, it's type module attribute, um, and that allows you to use this kind of more modern style of um, of of import um, from uh, sorry from a, a so it's kind of a way of including a library or piece of JavaScript into your um, into your page, um, and it's a kind of more up to date way of doing things. Um, you can, I think, there, of course, um, you could, here, for legacy environments, you can load D3's fetch um, in this manner. So, probably kind of the way that you're, um, you've probably seen uh, many websites do. And that's actually the way that we're including the code for, for the leaflet um, library. Okay, so we get a path to a file. Um, and this is a relative path. We could actually specify HTTPS and go off and get somewhere. Um, but as we're hosting this HTML in the same place, I'm going to, um, I should be able to get it just by, yeah, it's called gppractices.csv. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is log out the data actually that's this is perfect let's just try this and see what happens so um i'm going to open this in a new window and i'm going to bring up the console and as you can see here we've got an array of 898 um rows and that library is um quite clever because the it's taken the first row and used that as um, object keys. So it's been clever enough to figure out that like the first row is not actually a row of data, but in fact are just labels for the, the columns. And it's given us an array of objects. So the first one here is a, um, a practice in Edinburgh with latitude, longitude. It's got postcode, it's got practice name, it's got, um, an amount of prescriptions and it's got that SIMD index. 
So what else can we do soon? next here? Let's go back. Okay. So you should notice that it's using the um, that this is an asynchronous function, right? So this may take. We don't actually know when this is going to happen. We're it may take a moment for this CSV to come and get downloaded and then um, be parsed. So we can't just write data equals and then start performing some kind of operations on data afterwards. We have to use um, we have to use a callback. So that's why you have um, you're chained on. There's the then function, which says so. Basically, when this is complete, you've finished parsing this, then do this thing. So this is where we've got a function um, where we log out the data. So next step, great. We don't care about our um, data set here. We're going to now use a real data set. So I'm going to move this loop into the callback um, that tells us that our data is ready. Um, so I don't probably don't want to log out every single one of these rows. So I'm going to delete that bit. Um, and what I will do is instead of just binding hello, we're going to bind um, the practice name to the tooltip. Now in our fake data set, we had um, a property called cowards, which I don't believe we get in the um, in the spreadsheet or the CSV file. I think it was lat and long, like that. Oh, lat long, yeah, that's it. Um, surprised I got that first time. So um, that comes in, um, that has to be given to leaflet in the form of an array. So you've got an array of two elements, a lot and long. Um, let me just check that this makes sense. So West End Medical, even Marchment, you know, yes, that looks right to me. And if we zoom out, voila, we have now dynamically added um, date to the map based off of our CSV file. I might zoom out a little bit. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so I mentioned before that we'd like to visualize kind of what's going on with the prescriptions. So um, I don't know what the units this radius um, is provided with, uh, but let's just start by plugging in prescriptions and see what happens. Okay, so the size of the bubble is being, um, we have a bit of an issue here that this one is so massive that it's sort of eclipsing the others. Um, maybe deal with that later. Um, perhaps it might be smart to give them a minimum size. Um, or perhaps we maybe just make them a bit smaller by multiplying by half. Yeah, okay, we've still got that problem, but let's let's not worry about that for the moment. Um, the good news is we have a data set showing where things are, and we are giving a, some sort of sense of the um, a number of prescriptions. Now I think these, um, I think these are these actually the circles, uh, sorry the outlines are quite big so I might just take those off and then we'll just rely on using, okay, 
So that's, yeah, that's quite small. Okay, I'm going to put it back the way it was. We'll stop playing around. Because um, that kind of gives us a bit of a minimum size um, to the points on the map. Um, so where were we? What should we do now? So we've got, um, we've got, we have the points, tooltips, and we do not yet have the colors associated with the um, the SIMD um, index. So the index goes from one to ten. So we're going to create a gradient. Of um uh, of of blue to red or red to blue, um whichever way around makes sense, and we are going to select a color based off of the uh based off of the the SIMD value, um so I don't remember what that was so let me just just check the data here, so I'm logging it out. And if I open up one of the elements. So SIMD deprivation group, and it goes from one to 10. Um, so if I use this key, SIMD, uh, so the way I'm gonna approach this is to create an array of colors. So I'm gonna put 10 um, colors in here to match the number of um, the SIMD index. So it's gonna go from one to 10. Um, arrays go from zero to nine, so we're gonna to have to do some kind of conversion there to change, you know, we're just gonna subtract one so that we're using an index that will make sense, that will um, uh, make sense for our array. Um, so the idea here is the fill color is going to be the code is going to end up looking something like this where we've got um, a row in the data we plug in the deprivation group and we subtract by one to index the array appropriately so let's go and get some colors um, now I've got there's a very nice little uh, website called um, um, called color De designer and it has um, a gradient generator. So on the gradient generator, you can choose um, the colors you like and how many um, individual steps in the gradient you want to see. Um, I'm gonna do something pretty standard, red to blue, and you can choose the the mode and um, whether it steps through the color space um, it, it, how it steps through the color space uh, I'll stick to let's do, let's do hue the hue color space right so I've got a bunch of hex values here and I'm going to put the hex values into my color array right so I've got I should have 10 um, and rather tediously, I have to turn them into strings um, so that there are no errors. Come on. All right. One more. I think. Yeah, one more. So this array goes here, colors. So we've got a list of colors and we are going to use them like so. So colors, the deprivation group, 
and minus one so that you know if we have um so that deprivation group one um indexes by being subtracted to zero back to zero so uh we index the first one with um with zero um i don't think i'm um so something's wrong here i forgot comma that's it it doesn't it looks pretty red doesn't it uh but it's the it's the boundary color it's the stroke color so let's just do the same thing for the stroke color excellent okay there we go excellent um so there's a color show color grand could probably do with this um this outline being a little bit thinner so let's check how we can do that in the documentation so path stroke true color weight the stroke within pistols uh in pixels pistols pixels so let's flip back to the options and we're going to change weight to one pixel nice okay yeah i would go for two two's okay great great there we go um no, maybe he's a little bit bigger. Okay. All right. Could pixel push all day, but let's get on with the, the exercise. Okay. So we've kind of, we've done the visualization part. Um, and there are some other properties in there, um, such as the local authority. And we could start to maybe show the boundaries and do other stuff. But let's go and start to add our controls. So I'm going to hard code the controls. So I'm going to start off with the um, the drop down, which in HTML, uh, HTML parlance is uh, a select. So select have um, option elements on the inside, um, and they to, and you need to provide two things. Um, one is the kind of label which you put in between the tags. So let's start with all. Um, and the other thing that you do is you provide a sort of value attribute, which tells you what, um, uh, yeah, what the value is going to be, um, which is not necessarily the same thing, right? So we've got one, two, ten. Yeah, so let's see, did I get that right? Nine. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Yes, I did. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, drop down. So the idea is we click one of these and we filter out all the other ones um, uh, that are, we filter all down only to. Um, SIMT5, or we go back to the full picture by clicking all. So, let's see here. So there's a few ways we could approach this. Um, the way I guess I'm gonna go for it is to remove all the, um, we're gonna remove all the layers, uh, sorry, all the circles from the map. And then we're going to filter the data and then draw using our loop that we already have, um, just run that again. You could do, uh, you could approach this in, a, in another way, but um, let's go with that for now. So, um, okay. So the starting point, we need to, uh, go to comma, we need to um, actually observe, we, we first off, we need to bind an event handler to this control. So it would help us to add an ID so that we can select that control. Um, so I'll call this SIMD filter. And SIMD filter, so we have to select that using 
um, the DOM API. So get element by ID and we pass it in. And then we add an event listener where, um, and then we've got a function that runs when that is uh, the event listener triggered. Oh, so we need to define what event to listen to. So um, in my case, we're going to, in this case, we're going to listen to the change event. So right when somebody changes the value um, and we get an event back and the event object has various uh, bits and pieces about the, the event. Um, and one thing it has as a property is the target. So the target is the actual element, is the SIMD filter element. Um, and the main thing we're after is the, val Oop, the value that comes back. So if I go over here, bring up the console, click SIMD4 or 7, or let's just ignore these errors over here. Um, I click all, I get an empty string. Okay, we'll just decide that that's um, what we're going to use as a special term for um, for all. We'll just leave that as empty. Um, okay, so we've got that happening. So we need to figure out the logic to filter down the data um, to what to this the selected filter. So um, we're going to loop through each element uh, every row in this that we have and we're going to do comparison um, so we'll need to do something like this so we're going to have to look at the SIMD deprivation group and we will need to check that it is equal to the target value right so if it's if it's comparable to the target value, then we want to keep it. If not, we're going to get rid of it. And um, so the way I'm going to do this is create a new array called uh, filtered filtered data, and it's um, empty. Let's do that. Um, and if we have a match, then we append we append to that array. So we push the uh, the row to it, um, the array element to the new array, and then we're going to draw indentations off, and then we're going to draw the data um, based off of that. So, um, now we need to handle the case where somebody clicks the all. So we need to um, do an if. So if the target value is empty, that is an empty string, then the filter data um, is just going to be um, just set to the entire data set. Um, now that's not going to work. That needs to be come before that. Uh, now, if we run this, we're going to run into a problem because hmm, it doesn't error. Um, Let's see. Okay, that's not working as I expected. Bear with me. Um, just start adding some logs in here to get some results right, so we see what's going on 
So filter data is an empty array. Um, and then we get down to here. And it doesn't seem to show. Let's just check this. Yeah, it's not reaching that point in code. Ah, this will be my fault for not showing the errors. So data is not defined. The reason we don't have access to data here is that it is inside the scope and only available over here in the um, in the request callback. So just for the sake of making it um, so for the sake of making it available, I'm going to do something very quick and I'm going to make a kind of kind of globally publicly available uh, variable called data um, attached to window so that we can get it down here. So window.data. So now if we trigger the change event, now we should start to be filtering. So every time I click one of these, um, I get a new array of a different size. So this one's 56. So how many the how many GP practice do we have for SIMD 10? We've got 51. Um, and if we click all, we should get all 898. Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna get rid of the, the logging here. We don't need that, that seems to be working well. So, so the end result is we've got a new array called filtered data. Um, and we need to now just re-render the circles um, with the appropriate um, filtered data, right? So I'm gonna do a little bit of refactoring here. At this point, um, we're basically going to be doing the same thing over again. I would be duplicating the code if I just copied and pasted that there. Also, it wouldn't quite work because it would just draw some circles on top of the circles that we already have. So we need to um, remove the ones that we've got at the moment. Um, in order to remove them, um, we need to um, keep a hold of them because, in fact, outside of this loop, outside of this function, we... Um, don't have any access to them. So we need to kind of, we need to create, um, there's a few ways of doing this. I could just sort of build up an array and then look through that array and delete them. But actually Leaflet has a, um, a grouping class that we can use to do this. So if I have a look in, if you have a look at the reference, um, I'm trying to remember what it's called. I think it's layer group, right? So layer group. So the idea that, um, the way layer group works is you create a layer group and you pass in markers or circles or whatever else it is. These are all layers. And then we add it to the map. So I'm going to create a layer group to hold on to our circle data, um, our, our circle objects, right? So I'm going to make a new uh, layer, layer group, um, group, we'll call it. Uh, let's just call it circles, circle group. And it's just going to be empty at the moment. Um, and we're going to use this add layer function later on. Um, so circle group. So instead of adding the circle to the map, we are going to add our circle to our layer group. And it's not called polyline. Okay, great. So circle group is defined outside of this uh, code block, so we can use it later on. So we can refer to circle group and we can remove um, the elements using um, I think there's a function that clear 
layers. Let's have a look here. Just clean up my tabs. Um, layer group. Layer group. So what methods have you got? We've got add layer, remove layer, as layer, clear layers, yeah, clear layers. I think that's what we want. So circle group dot clear layers. So let's just check that works. All right. So if I click one of these, it deletes all the all the uh, circles. Um, great. But we need to draw them again. So this is where uh, I would like to bring in that bit of refactoring. We should share a function that does this drawing um, behavior. So let's create a function that renders or appends circles to the map. So what we're going to do is it's going to take in data and um, it's going to look pretty much like our what we have here. Um, the one thing it's going to do though, before it adds any circles to the map, it's going to remove everything from the group. So the idea here is that um, we can call render circles, whatever we want, and it will um, start afresh. So the nice thing about render circles is we can call it here and we can call it here with our filter data. Let's tidy this up. Okay. So we've got the kind of event of when the GP practices spreadsheets downloaded and parsed. And then we've got the event of when we hit change. So let's see if this works. Et voila. So here's the rich places. And geography starts to shift a little bit. Oh yeah, the nice thing about the change event, it's not about clicking. You can use your keyboard too. So I'm just going up and down on my uh, on my uh, uh, on my keyboard um, so one two so one and two primarily urban yep still pretty central belt bit more rural quite rural bit of both six seems to be quite rural um, and then the very well off places tend to be in the cities there you go and then we've got all, so we can move back to um, seeing everything. And that completes our first control for filtering. So the next filter we're going to introduce is um, a numeric filter where we're going to filter out um, by the number of prescriptions or the dosages of prescriptions. I think it's in mil units of five milligram dosages that were issued by the practices. Um, I think we can double check this. I'll put this in the show notes or something. Um, but, you know, we'll focus on figuring out how to get this to work with Leaflet. So we're going to kind of basically repeat the same process um, with some minor tweaks. So the same process of defining a control. So I'm going to add a input tag. Input. Um, I'm going to give it a name. Presk. I'll just shorten prescription to Presk. To Presk filter. Um, we tell it to be numeric. And we can give it a default value and leave it empty. I'm going to leave it empty. Um, I am going to put a margin here. Yeah, there we go. Okay. You can give it a placeholder. So placeholder. This is a nice thing to say, uh, to add. Um, 
placeholder. Mm. So we know what the control does. Prescriptions filter. Remember? Yeah, there we go. So because it's of type number, it won't accept text. It shouldn't accept text. Odd, odd behavior. I thought it wouldn't accept that. But anyway, um, the idea is that it's it's for numbers. Um, so we've added the control. It's got an ID. We're going to do something pretty similar here. Um, you know what? I'm just going to copy and paste and change. Um, change is fine as an event handler. Um, we get the same event object back from when that runs. Um, let's just for the first part here, we I'm going to comment this out and just check that that's working by logging out the value that is given by using the filter, uh, using the control. So if I type one um, and I hit enter, I get the value if I click up. Yeah, so I trigger a change event anytime I click on these up and down arrow buttons. And if I use the keyboard to go up and down, that works. If I just type in a number, it doesn't trigger it. But if I press return, or if I click outside of the um, bounds of the input, it triggers the event. But that seems to be working fine. So let's go back here. So if it's empty, then we are not going to do anything. Let's just use all the data. That seems okay. Um, let's use that. We're going to do the same thing again, except we're not lim we're not comparing to the deprivation group. We're going to compare to prescriptions. And we're not going to do a like for like match. Let's just do less than or equal to. Now we might be comparing apples and oranges here because prescriptions might be, this might come in the form of a string and this might be an integer. And uh, I think that's a flow actually. So this might not quite work. Um, we might need to do some parsing. Okay, that actually seems like it's working. So 100. Okay, let's move this up. Okay. Thousand. Yeah, that's some funny behavior. I don't, I'm not convinced about this. Um, I think what we need to do is parse float. So what that does is it takes, you know, uh, it'll take a string that looks like this and actually turn it into um, a number that, that's comparable. Um, the less than or equal to operation there, you can actually do this with, with strings in JavaScript. You can compare one to the other. So it might look like you won't get an error if you're comparing a string and a number. It will probably just turn one of the numbers into a string or trying to turn um, the string into a number based on the order in which it's running. So it's best to kind of just try and be um, explicit about what you're comparing here. Um, this is this is not flow, it's an integer, but let, let's just try and make sure that they are both, we're comparing um, two of the same types here. So let's give that a shot. Let's try. So if I put in 1000, nothing happens. Um, is prescriptions the right? Key I'm looking for prescriptions. Now this looks like a string. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of warnings. 
two point three four. Yeah. Um something's not quite right about this, so let's just try to log out what's going on here. Okay. So we're gonna parse out, we're gonna um print out the result of that parse flow operation. So if I do this, it's kind of highlighted a little bit different. So that should be a number. Um, if I log out our comparison here, I think I've discovered what's wrong here, or what does not look right at all. This should really be window.data. Window.data. Um, yeah. Okay. Because we need to grab that um, global variable that we defined at the very instance. And we're going to hold on to that as, you know, that's the whole data set and we're going to keep it there globally. Um, let's try this again. Okay, I think I think we're we're working okay. Uh, why this worked in this case but didn't in this case? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, it's working, so that's okay. Um, let's uh, kill some of this logging. We don't need that. Might get in the way. Okay, so um, we're talking a tiny amount of prescriptions issued to a large number. So as I push up on my keyboard, we can see all the, yeah, I, maybe larger practices or more intense practices. Maybe they serve more people. Um, I, I'm not sure what that means. Anyway, we've got two fantastic filters running side by side, side by side, but not together. So unfortunately, they don't combine in any way at all. So our next challenge is to combine these two, um, these filters. So to do this, I'm going to create a new function, um, which will be responsible for filtering. So filter, let's, let's call it, um, filter data um, and we're going to effectively the result of filter data is going to be rendering the circles right the first thing we do is um, we're going to take the same approach so we're going to use filter data function um, for both of our um, controls. So our controls now are going to run, are going to call filter data. Um, and there's an easier way to write this Right, we can just instead of writing a, opening up an anonymous function and then running a function inside it, we can just say filter data. And the same for the other event listener. Okay, cool. So this is gonna run. Oh, I have I thought I'd, uh, I'd lost that code there. So 
let's just tighten this up a bit um, so we don't get lost. Okay, so we have this bit filters down to the this, this this part, this first bit of code filters down the SIMD deprivation group, and the second part filters down the um, the prescriptions. Now, event dot uh, sorry, event dot target to value. Um, it doesn't make sense to use this based off of the um, uh, based off of the event um, parameter. What we need to do, because the thing is. We're going to be running both these filters, but if we use event dot target to value for um, for for trying to filter prescriptions here, but the event was triggered by clicking on this, and we're going to get the wrong thing. So instead of event dot target to value, we're going to just grab the value. We're going to be specific about where this value is going to come from. So instead of I want you to just give me the element. That triggered the event and get the value from there. I want to be more specific and just select um, select it. Um, for the sake of being clear, I'm going to put uh, assign it into like a uh, into a variable here. So we've got our prescription value. And up here we've got our SIMD value. Um, and that comes from the SIMD filter. Um, now filter data. So we are going to, so we're gonna filter once first through the SIMD selection and then filter again through the prescription filter. Um, so the way I'm going to achieve this is by um, effectively we're going to have our array of um, filtered data by the SIMD filter. So we've got a new empty array and we're going to use this here. So it does the same thing as before. We've got an empty array. If there is no filter selected, then we just use the whole shebang. If there is something selected, then we filter through and we push to it. Um, and then that gives us a filter down data set. Now what happens next? We're going to have to change this one to kind of you actually um, be based on the SIMD filter data. Now it might be the whole, it might actually just be the whole data set. It might be filtered down a little bit. Um, but the idea here is if we don't have a value, instead of using the whole um, original um, data set of practices, we're going to use the filtered um, the SIMD filtered data, right? So imagine this is the instance where I go over here, I choose, um, I choose one of these, but I don't set any prescription filter. This is what's going to happen: is we will use that filtered data. The next thing we need to do is we are instead of looping through the whole spreadsheet um, and filtering down based on the 800 or so rows, we need to filter, um, apply or filter through the original filter that we've um, run already. So It's completely, um, I mean, we could have run this one first and then this one. It doesn't really matter. Um, just imagine we've kind of got a little bit of a waterfall going on here and we've got our various filters, right? So we have, we're starting off from the top, looping through the whole thing. Um, and then we have a kind of a smaller data set. And then in the next step, we filter through 
that um, reduce data set. Um, we we could reverse these, but it it doesn't it doesn't really matter which way you do it first. So um, I think this is ready to go. Uh, if I've not missed something. Oh, I have missed something, right? Event a target to value. That's we don't want that. We want to use SIMD value. Right? We're not worrying about the event object anymore. And in this case, we're seeing if we have an empty value in the um in the text box. So we shouldn't be seeing event.target.value anymore. Oh no, I've missed a spot. Okay, so we shouldn't be using event.target.value anymore. There we go. Right, let's try this out. So First off, we can filter by the SIMD. And secondly, we should be able to filter by prescriptions. Here we go. And if I choose all, let's see, are we getting that second filter applied? It doesn't look like it. Oh no. Okay, let's try this. Sign P7, P9, 1. Um, now we need to try vice versa, right? So if I take away this filter, take away this filter, hooray, we are filtering using an AND operation. And I guess this concludes our video. Um, I would like to just say that there is a sort of pattern here that you can apply to um, any kind of visualization that you're doing that's like this, where you, um, you know, uh, you are bringing in some data, setting up a map, um, rendering circles or whatever it is um, driven by the data that you have and then when you're using controls you're filtering the data you're modifying the data you have another view upon the data and then you're re-rendering again so um, what a way to that I like to think about it is that you have code that you're running when the page loads it's a once-off right you're creating a bunch of um, you're setting up the canvas so in our case, our canvas is the map, adding the tile layers, setting up these kind of constants for the colors. We just need to do this once. Um, we then are, um, you know, we are then laying out uh, our functions. Um, I'm going to put this down here. The, m there might be some utility functions. Um, there might be some other functions that we need to create to kind of help us sort through the data. Uh, thankfully, the um, the D three fetch CSV function here is kind of doing quite a lot of heavy lifting for us. That's great. Um, so let's say here, this is the one-off stuff. Right, it's one off. It's on the when the page loads, we do it. Even though we're binding the event listener here, and like nothing's happening. Nothing. This this won't be the filter date is not triggered until we start interacting with the controls. Um, this is, I guess, what kicks off our rendering. Right. So here we've got render circles. So we've got our rendering method that we can call again and again. And no matter what you know, what we throw at it, it will figure out what to draw. 
and then we've kind of got our like filtering logic um, that basically its job is just to um, manipulate the data, create a view onto it, and then trigger the re-rendering, right? So if this is kind of a pattern I like to follow and think about um, because it's um, it's a kind of neat way to kind of come back to data visualizations. And if you haven't looked at the code in a while, then it's easy to see kind of, okay, right, this is where I'm, you know, the, this is the meat of a, you know, where I'm going to have to write a lot of comparison code. Um, this is the thing I can just, I should be able to just try things out, run it, and fire in to um, uh, fire this off um, whenever need be after I've done some kind of filtering. Um, and then the one-off stuff. This is like the, um, yeah, as I say, setting up your canvas. Um, I shouldn't need to kind of go in and manipulate or change any of this stuff um, once, the, once the application's running. The, I guess the exception to this can be when you have events that significantly change the um, the display or the interaction method of your um, of uh, of of your visualization or the controls. So if you think about maybe um, uh, somebody might come in and resize the window, so I'm resize the window like this. I might want to actually re redraw the map altogether so it's um, it, it, it fits the window size or something like that. But on the whole, this is the sort of stuff. It's one-off filtering logic and the things that I will re-render. You might, you might need to re-render, um, you might actually need to, in some cases, re-render your controls because um, you can sometimes have a case where um, choosing one filter impacts another control and what you can select and what is a valid selection in another control. So um, it's not just about the points on the map or um, a graph or whatever it is that you have. Anyway, I hope that's been helpful. If there are any uh, data sets or controls or other types of filtering that you would like to see, uh, please let me know. And uh, I will be picking some of these examples, um, including the starter and the finished article into the show notes. Bye for now.